Hey guys, it's Libby. This is my wrap up for July. Um, I actually read no like physical novels this month because I spent about two and a half weeks traveling um, in England around London, Bath, and the South Coast. So this month I read five things. One of them was a play, one of them was a short story, uh, one of them was a graphic novel, and two of them were audiobooks. So the first one I read was Timon of Athens by William Shakespeare. Um, this is definitely one of Shakespeare's less well-known, less read, less taught, less performed plays. Um, I actually wasn't going to read it. I only read it because I saw a production at the Folger Theatre in DC. Um, so um, I actually thought it was a pretty good play and I was like, why, why has this been so forgotten? This is actually like pretty decent. Um, and then we got to the end and I felt like I had just been cut adrift and there was like no ending whatsoever. Shakespeare normally ends his plays, like if it's a comedy, some important character will come out and say like, and now everything is happy. These people are getting married and these people are getting married and I am getting married and order is restored and all is good. Or if it's a tragedy, then someone will come out and say, look at all these dead people. We sure have made some mistakes. Hopefully we will learn from them. Uh, that didn't happen in Time of Athens, um, at least in, in the play that I saw. So like that just seems awfully weird. So I went back and read it, and it's actually really, really different from the production that they put on, which is kind of disappointing. Um, because like Romeo and Juliet, I've actually, I saw a production of Romeo and Juliet as well this month, and they changed a lot of things. They cut out some minor characters and gave their lines to major characters. Um, they interwove the scenes so that like dialogue was happening at the same time. Um, and they also cut a lot of the text. And I feel okay about that because everybody knows the story of Romeo and Juliet. And so if you want to do something new and interesting and creative, um, and you need to cut the text for that, that's fine. But Time of Athens, like they were talking about how um, this is the first time Time of Athens has been put on in the DC area for 20 years. And like, so you need to actually do the play because no one knows what it's about. Like, unfortunately, you don't get to be creative here because you need to like let people, people need to have the initial experience of it in the way it's supposed to be seen before they can appreciate the changes you make. Anyway, so um, I went home and read this, and I have to admit, in several ways, the way they changed it did make the play better. Um, there's a lot of like servant characters who sort of all get condensed down into one, and that makes things feel a lot speedier, but God, that ending. You just have to, you just have to do the end of the play. I'm sorry. So anyway, um, Timon of Athens is a tragedy. Um, it's set in ancient Greece, and Timon is kind of a peripheral character in one of the big stories of Athenian history, Alcibiades. Um, Alcibiades was a um, general, and he betrayed Athens twice. Once to the Persians, he helped the Persians sack Athens, um, and uh, and then ten years later, <laughs> he came back. And he's like, hey guys, can I come back into Athens? And he was so pretty, and like everybody had a crush on him. And they were like, yeah, you can come back and hang out with us again. And then he went and betrayed the Athenians to Sparta. So this is set, I believe, during the second um, time Alcibiades is attacking Athens with the Spartans. Um, so Alcibiades is a minor character in Timon of Athens, and Timon um, is a friend of his, and he likes to um, give lots of money to his friends. He's a very generous man. Um, but eventually it turns out that he has given away more than he owns and he is now totally broke. Um, so he sends his servants around to ask all the people he's been kind to over the years if they can help him out financially. And everyone's like, oh gosh, no. I mean, if you told me yesterday, I totally would have given him money. But like, I just made an investment and so I don't have any money to give you right now. And that sort of thing happens with like everybody. So Timon just goes, fuck it, and he um, insults everyone, everyone who's important in Athens, and then he gets kicked out of the city and he has to go live uh, in a cave on the edges with no friends and no food and no money. I thought this was like a decent play of Shakespeare's. It doesn't, you know, make me angry like um, uh, Taming of the Shrew. I almost said a turn of the screw. That's a different thing. Um, and it also didn't make the mistake that a lot of Shakespeare's plays make, which is to have like a B plot that no one cares about. This is all 
a plot. Like, all of the side characters are directly dealing with Tymon's issues. They don't have their own stuff going on. So it's um, like a sort of tight, sleek play. Um, gets in there, gives you the message that it needs to give you, and then kills people. So I'm giving this one a 3.5. It's definitely not the place you want to start with Shakespeare because like there's a lot of way more famous plays um, that you should probably have a handle on. But if you've already read some Shakespeare and you want to read a more obscure one, this is a good more obscure one. It's better than like Henry VIII. The next thing I read was a short story from Tor.com. Um, it's by Sunny Moraine and it's called Eyes I Dare Not Meet in Dreams. I heard about this from the Tor newsletter and they said this is a story about dead girls climbing out of refrigerators and I was like, you have intrigued me. Um, so there's not really a lot to tell you about. Um, I think short stories can kind of do, they, in that limited amount of space you can kind of pick one thing to develop, either character, plot, or atmosphere. This one's definitely focused on developing atmosphere, like there's basically no named characters, except Anderson Cooper. Anderson Cooper's in it. Um, and uh, there isn't really a plot, it's just sort of about what would happen if all of a sudden um, a bunch of uh, girls who had died uh, climbed out of abandoned refrigerators. It's strange, no one's gonna deny that it is strange, but I thought it was interesting and I gave it four stars. The next book I read, um, I've actually already lent to a friend, so I don't have a physical copy to show you, but it was The 100 Nights of Hero by Isabel Greenberg. I actually just got this um, for my last book haul, um, so I, if you wanna look at any of the art, um, go check out that video. I actually talked about it a whole lot in that video, so just to briefly recap, um, this is about a guy who is trying to get this woman to sleep with him and he has 100 nights to do it, but she gets her girlfriend to um, tell stories Arabian Nights like to fill up the time. So there's a lot of stories within stories. Um, I quite liked it. Um, it wasn't like totally mind-blowingly amazing, um, but the stories were enjoyable. Um, it's quite similar to Emily Carroll's Through the Woods. Uh, I gave it four stars. And then the last two books I read were both audiobooks by Thomas Hardy. So the first one that I started, although I did finish it afterwards, um, was The Return of the Native. Um, I have read this several times. Um, I actually know it quite well because I have produced um, a public domain um, full cast audiobook of it, um, which is available on LibriVox. Um, I listened to um, that for part of it, and I actually have to say I did, I did a decent job. I, um, I played a couple of characters. I played um, one of the mummers at the Christmas pageant, the Saracen, and I played Captain Vi's servant, and I did an acceptable West Country accent. Now, I read this because um, I was taking my mom on a walking tour of Dorset, um, hoping to get her to appreciate Thomas Hardy the way I do, because she had only read books that she didn't like by him. Um, I, she does like Return of the Native, although I don't think she's finished it yet, and I'm not sure how she's gonna feel about the ending. So The Return of the Native is a love pentagon. Thomas Hardy can never keep himself to just a triangle. Um, and the, the people involved are um, Damon Wildeve, who uh, was sort of supposed to be an engineer. He had, um, he had a, a good life in front of him, and then he um, sort of decided to not do that and just run an inn in the middle of nowhere on this place called Egdon Heath. Um, and he, at the beginning um, of the book, has left to be married to his fiance, Thomason, um, who is the niece of uh, Mrs. Yobright, one of the sort of more respectable ladies of Egdon Heath. Um, Mrs. Yobright also has a son named Clem, who um, has been in Paris being like a fine gentleman and learning all sorts of things and being, you know, cosmopolitan and not like all these provincial people back home, which is very attractive to a young lady named Eustacia Vi, who grew up in the city, Budmouth, um, but now um, she lives with her grandfather on Egdon Heath and she really hates it. Um, she also had a bit of a thing with Damon Wilde before he was engaged to Thomason, so... And then we also have the Reddleman, who is a man named Diggory Venn. Um, Reddle was a sort of um, pigment that people would put on um, their sheep. Uh, they put them on rams' bellies to see when they have like mounted the female sheep so they know which of their sheep are impregnated. Honestly, everything I know about sheep farming comes from Thomas Hardy, from Return of the Native and also Far From the Mounting Crowd, which is like all about sheep herding. Um, 
Uh, and uh, so Dickory Van, because um, he works with this red pigment, he is completely red. His clothes are stained red. His skin is stained red. He's very mysterious. And he um, is also in love with Thomason. So there's a whole big mess. There's an odd number of people, so you know that this isn't all gonna work out. This book is probably not my favorite in terms of like the plot and all of the character interactions. It's still good, but it's not like, oh my god, my brain. Um, I really do like the atmosphere of this one though. It's very isolated. How far away all the houses are from each other is a really big influence on the characters because you have to walk like two miles, five miles to get to somebody else's house and on these long walks all sorts of interesting things happen. In fact, very few scenes occur inside. Most of the scenes occur um, on the heath through chance meetings or sometimes not so chance meetings. And then I wasn't planning to listen to the other Thomas Hardy book, but mm, uh, it was The Well Beloved, um, which is his last published novel, although I believe it was published serially before Jude the Obscure. So it's the second to last novel that he wrote. Um, and it is set on Portland Island, which is an island off of Weymouth. Um, I had to think for a second to make sure that Weymouth is, is actually called Weymouth um, because Thomas Hardy, um, he uses like the real um, county of Dorset and Cornwall and um, Somerset, the surrounding areas for his fictional world of Wessex. And he just renames all of the locations. So it's like, wait, is Weymouth the real place or the Thomas Hardy place? It's the real place. Um, Portland Island is the real place, and then Thomas Hardy calls it the Isle of Slingers. And I have read The Well Beloved before, um, and the, the first part of the walking tour is like six days. Um, we were walking around further inland, but then at the end we were walking along the South Coast Trail from um, Lyme Regis to Abbotsbury, if you know the area. Um, so I'm walking east, uh, and on the horizon I just see Portland Island, like, gradually emerging out of the mists as I walk closer and closer to it. And I was like, Libby, you're already listening to another Thomas Hardy book. Don't start another. And then I went home at the end of the first day on the South Coast Trail and I was like, okay, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna look at the page for the audiobook. I'm not gonna download it or anything. I just wanna have a look. And I looked and I was like, wait, it's only like six hours long? That's like one day of walking. I can, I can get through that like that. So I did, I listened to it and I totally loved it. Now, Katie from Books and Things has actually just recently done a series on all of Thomas Hardy's books. Um, each book gets one video and she goes through them in order from her least favorite to her most favorite. Um, and The Well Beloved is her least favorite, which like I can kind of understand because all of the other ones are so good. Um, but I actually kind of like the Well Beloved. The first time I read it, I finished it and I was like, I don't know if I completely love this or completely hate this um, because the main character, it, it, he is hard to like. Um, so it's about this guy named Jocelyn Pearson um, and it takes place, first we see him when he's 20, then we see him when he's 40, then we see him when he is 60. Um, and his whole thing is that he is faithful to his Well Beloved but his idealized concept of the well-beloved sometimes inhabits this woman, sometimes inhabits that woman. Um, and at one point he's explaining this to his friend and his friend is like, dude, like you're just fickle and kind of a douche to all these women you get involved with. And he's like, no, like I really feel this. And I don't really buy what Jocelyn's saying, but I'm not sure if Thomas Hardy wants you to buy what he's saying. Hmm. And like the creepy and unlikable factor um, comes in in that he gets sort of involved or uh, tries to marry um, uh, three women from one family in different generations. So as he gets older, his romantic interests stay the same age until at the end, like he's 60 and he's trying to marry this like 19 year old, which is kind of ugh. And he does have other sort of amorous involvements along the way. So basically the way that I am able to like this book is that I have just decided that Marcia Bencombe, um, who is one of his, um, I don't know, girlfriends um, from earlier on in the book, is actually his one true love and he just doesn't realize it. And this whole time he's dealing with the three women from the Caro family. He's just not ready for Marcia yet. He needs to get himself emotionally ready. Is this supported by the text? Maybe a little bit, but it's what I need to do in order to like this book. 
So uh, I gave it four stars. It's probably more of like a 3.75. I don't know. Whenever I'm like actually listening to it, I like it more than when I go back and think about it later. So like if you ask me while I'm listening to it, it's easily a four. But right now I'm like, it's probably not quite a four. Preview of next month's wrap up. Um, I actually started um, The Mayor of Casterbridge when I finished The Return of the Native. Uh, or when I finished The Well Beloved. Um, but I am not done with that yet, so you'll hear more about it next month. Until then, thank you very much for watching, guys. I will see you later. Um, hey, I forgot to mention, uh, I'm moving to Amsterdam in like a month or two, um, like permanently, like I'm gonna be a Dutch person. Uh, so expect to see some scenery changes in the near future. I'm gonna move into my parents' house for a couple of weeks once I've sold this place and before I'm able to move to Amsterdam. Um, so shout out to all those people who remember the early videos I made back when I was at my parents' house. I cannot believe you are still watching after sitting through that horrible mess. Thank you very much.